technology is great, unless it doesn't work. <laughs> anyway, I was saying it's such a, a blessing to be reminded here this morning that we dwell in the shelter of Shaddai and his protection. Um, as the psalmist put it, what have I have to fear? What can man do to me? Right? Nothing. It's a high Sabbath. Not only is it a Sabbath where we can welcome two into our family, Katrina and Luke, but also communion Sabbath. And before we have communion, I just have a few words I'd like to share with you as we continue in our series on love and law, which is the Ten Commandments. Because we have found over the last few Sabbaths that God's love is embedded in his law. A lot of the world views the law as something, the commandments as something to be rid of so we can be free, but it's exactly opposite. We are free in keeping the commandments of God. Can you imagine a society that said, hey, you know what? We don't need our laws. Just go be free. How would that go? Not very well. So we're reminded that God's love is embedded in his law. And today we're looking at the fifth commandment. Would you bow your heads with me as we ask for the Lord's presence? Father, Lord, this commandment is the first of the last, the second table of stone. But Lord, we want it to become not just a table of stone, but we want you to implant it in our flesh, in our heart. And so we pray that you would lead me in the words that I share and us in our understanding. Speak to us through your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a recent CNBC article online entitled Americans are least likely to care about kids having good manners. It caught my attention. I said, hmm, exactly, hmm. I've kind of been observing this over the last couple of decades, but somebody's talking about it. And I'm sure a lot of people are talking about it, but this caught my attention. And it used data from one of the biggest social surveys in the world, the World Values Survey. A recent report by King's College London, which peered into the priorities of each nation's parents placed on raising children. So 24 countries were surveyed. How do you raise children? What's important to, most important to you? Well, adults in the United States, it discovered, are least likely to say, least of all, to say that kids having good manners is an important quality. Just 52% of all countries. That makes the US the country least likely to believe good manners are crucial for kids a significant drop from 1990 when 76% of U.S. adults said it was very important to have kids with good manners. Another factor that falls under the broader idea of kids being well-behaved or having good manners is if they listen to their parents or other adults. Even fewer U.S. adults said that obedience was a key quality for kids. In fact, it slid far behind other countries to the second half of the table at 21%. This was a red flag to many. And I'm giving you the worst of it. There were some things the, that the shift happened toward things that American parents tend to value the most. And one quality identified as especially important is tolerance and respect for other people. 71% in the U.S. said that it was a key attribute that kids should have. I agree, right? But it placed it 11th across all countries surveyed. Now, I struggled a little bit with tolerance because what do you mean when you say tolerant, right? One can say I'm tolerant of all people and all lifestyles and other things, 
But when it comes to somebody disagreeing with them, they're not so tolerant. So I, I question that one a little bit. But another quality the U.S. values is hard work. 68%. And independence, 56%. Sixth and seventh, respectively, across countries surveyed. So where we used to be at the top many decades ago, we're, we're at the bottom. And the one that disturbed me, of course, the most is the issue of obedience to parents. It doesn't seem to be such a high priority these days. It shouldn't surprise us probably because it's one of the Ten Commandments. It's the very first thing that God highlights in that second table. Children, obey your parents. But yet this country, which has been on a bit of a moral decline and accelerating even all the more, doesn't seem to think that that's important anymore. With these shifting priorities and how parents are raising their children today, we can imagine the impact it will have on the family, let alone society. When children aren't taught the importance of manners and obedience, the impact on the family and society will be devastating. We can be assured. Not only do we already see that impact manifest in public behavior at times, <laughs> but the long-term impact is beginning to, to also be seen as children grow into adulthood. You see, the Lord God who created marriage and the family is uniquely aware of the intricacies of the parent child relationship. He made it. So it shouldn't surprise us to find a commandment in this Decalogue that conveys its importance. Exodus 20, verse 12. Thank you, Lexi, for reading that. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. This commandment, while talking about children, really speaks to all ages. God did not intend to just speak to little children. It speaks to anybody with a living parent. How we show love and respect to our parents is one of the most basic qualities in human relationships. How we honor our fathers and mothers directly correlates with how we treat other people, especially those in authority. And furthermore, if parents fail, this is just a practical understanding or practical thing we can take away from this. If parents fail to teach their children honor and respect, they themselves are set up for how their children will treat them when they get to older age. And we're seeing of falling apart in that structure as well in our society. The Apostle Paul refers to this commandment in his letter to the church to Colossae, the Colossae believers, commanding children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Paul ties honoring parents with obedience that's how children show obedience or show honor to their parents. And you have to understand why he does this, why he's tying this, especially in that culture of the day. You see, Western culture is not like the Eastern culture. For us, it's very much uh, right and wrong driven, how you act, um, your character is defined, your reputation is defined by that. Where in the Eastern culture, everything is a shame or honor-shame perspective. In other words, we are a family, and what you do as a representative of our family determines whether you bring honor or shame to us. I wish we had a little bit more of that in our Western culture. 
But that's the culture in which Paul is writing this. It is pleasing to the Lord when children obey their parents. Now, some of you are thinking, I know it. How can God require me to obey my parents when they treated me with disrespect throughout my childhood? I've never been respected and cared for as a child. Very abandoned, maybe even ashamed as, how my, as to how my parents acted or behaved toward my friends. There are many here that have not had good models for parents, for fathers, and for mothers. And I understand that. And it makes it difficult. This command makes it difficult to them. How can they bring honor? How can you bring honor to your parents when they treated you so badly? But a few thoughts on this. Number one, I looked and I can't find a Bible verse that excuses us from honoring our parents because they treat us poorly. Couldn't find one. Please, if you find one, let me know. <laughs> I could not. The commandment itself is providing a path to breaking the cycle of dysfunction in families. You see, the goal is that if there is dysfunction in the family, this command would wake the family up and each individual will begin to model this honor that we should be bringing to the family as a whole. I would even venture to say this, if you want to repair a relationship with an adult, with someone that is older, still living, maybe still not treating you the way that you'd wanted them to treat you all your life, the best way to help to restore that relationship is to give them love and respect. That changes hearts. Someone can be completely harsh and inconsiderate, and you can speak with respect and love and grace and show care to them, and it will change their opinion about you. And God intends to keep the family unit in love and grace as he as well keeps his family in the same. Now, it's also a given that God does not require us to obey a parent if they demand something that conflicts with the word of God. We can't do that. But how you respond to them and how you share that you cannot do that because you serve God over what man wants is, is important as well. Yeah, have you heard the adage, it's not so much what you say, but sometimes how you say it, right? If we and our families did a better job with that ladder, the ladder, how we say things, maybe we could start bringing love and joy and respect and kindness back into that family unit. Now, for those of you who have had that modeled in your homes, praise God. You should praise God every day that you had a family. You had parents that loved you and cared for you. I had that family. And I thank the Lord constantly, all the time, for how they raised me. I believe that God-fearing parents, now this command, remember, who was it written to? It was written to God's people. This wasn't written to the world at large. These are those that are part of this community of faith. God-fearing parents then are responsible for raising up their children in the Lord. Their children are responsible to obey their parents, but both are accountable to God. Research has demonstrated repeatedly that a child's character is developed very early on in life. I mean, we're talking about, you know, by the time you reach six, seven years old, it is largely formed, 
at least the trajectory is formed as to what their character will be. And so we have to, we have to begin to mold and shape them early before that, right? Character building along with social and emotional positivity are, are key aspects of raising children to be confident, but yet respectful and in return honor, bring honor to not only their parents, but to anyone in authority over them. Within our education system itself, preschool teachers are in the best position to affect their students' characters outside the home. Early childhood development is critical for setting the tone for the rest of a person's life. Do you hear this? Where you choose to send your child to school as early as preschool can determine where they go for the rest of their life. It's one of the reasons why the Adventist system has a education system that is worldwide. And in part of our, our curriculum is to make sure that we instill a love and respect for God and in turn for our parents as we establish and support what is happening in the home. Now, recognize this. It, it is one thing to say that you pray and you hope that children receive a good character education in school. This is important. But equipping children with the ability to honor their fathers and mothers starts and ends with parents. Equipping children with the ability to honor their fathers and mothers starts and ends with who? With parents. What does the Bible say about this essential parental responsibility? Uh, look at this. Uh, Deuteronomy 11. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 11. We'll read verses 18 and 19 here. Actually, we're going to read through 21. 18 through 21. Deuteronomy 11, 18. Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart. This is God speaking of the Ten Commandments. And he's speaking through Moses, right? Moses, these are Moses' words, but they're coming from the Lord. He says, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Then you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And then listen to this, that your days, that your days and the days of your children may be what? Multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them like the days of the heavens above the earth. So not only in the fourth commandment is God saying, okay, children, honor your father and mother so that you'll live long lives, your fifth commandment. He's saying here that, listen, this goes both ways. How you raise your children in the Lord will determine how long you live as parents because also it will extend the life of your children and together as a family unit, you can have an abundant relationship and support network to keep you strong late in, to, into life. Does this make sense? It's not just, you know, parents saying, hey, listen, you need to obey me because this is a commandment of God. A, 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 a child could just as soon say, well, you should bring me up to, to do that. I'm, I, I'm past my time. How do I honor you? I mean, if you think about it, that would be a legitimate gripe. But the reality is, is that honoring our parents and education, even though it happens very early in life, continues on for a long time. In fact, I have seen wonderful, helpful parents continuing to teach and support their kids even after they're married in raising their own kids and how they did it and the mistakes they made 
Wouldn't it be great if we learn from the mistakes of others? Why do we have to make them all ourselves? Honor begins with obedience. It is true. We just saw that. But it doesn't stop there. There are many ways to honor parents. In fact, uh, the Ten Commandments, some of the scholars looking at this, the Ten Commandments aren't written to be exhaustive pieces of legislation that account for every life situation. It's not its intent. Yet there are inherent principles we can derive from the Decalogue. Bible scholars suggest that honoring your father and your mother also extends to other people in authority. And this is justifiable because in the Bible, titles of father and mother are also given to people that are not part of the family. Did you know that? Kids refer to father or mother, and they're not their biological parent. So how do we incorporate this into our church? Aren't we a fan? Didn't we sing, we're the family of God, right? We can love and support each other and our kids, our kids, God's kids, so that they are brought up in the Lord. I think that's a big thing, that reason for Sabbath school, right, Pastor Melanie? Sabbath school teaches our kids to love Jesus. And then how you build on that in your home is so essential for what will happen in their life later. If parents do not teach their children how to obey them in the home, how can we expect them to respect or yield to authority of others when they are adults? They will struggle. In fact, Paul reminds Timothy. Paul was a mentor to Timothy, who was a pastor, and asked him to integrate this principle into the church and to how the church conducted its business and cared for people. And he's, he writes this in 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, just to be sure, I'm not sharing this to be self-serving. I'm sharing this because Paul's talking about all the elders of the church, those in positions of leadership, how we should show them honor and respect and appreciation for all that they do as we go into our new cycle, beginning October 1, as we move into that new term. Let's look for ways to show honor to those in positions of leadership. I think all of you who participated for the last three years, remember we didn't go two, we went three because of the pandemic. The last three years of dedicating your time, your energy, your commitment to God and his church and to helping not us just as a family, but our kids, thank you. Thank you. You are a key piece of their ultimate destiny. And I'm not saying that lightly. You are. So what does it look like to show honor to parents or others in authority? I'm going to give you four different things about honor that will be helpful to answer that question. First of all, honor relates to position, as in a position of authority. We're to honor our parents because they justly earn it through their actions, not because they justly earn it through their actions, but because of their God-given position as parents. They brought us into this world. You are alive because of your parents. And so that is a reason that is something that we do. We give honor to them because of that position that they hold in our lives. The second one is, is honor involves giving preference. In a society where no one likes to give preference to another today, it sure seems like it, Paul encourages us to esteem others better than 
yourselves and to be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. We give preference to our parents, even reluctantly sometimes, and regardless of whether it's deserved. This is a difficult thing, because in our minds resides a naturally selfish heart, right? We want to give ourselves preference. We choose often to, 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 to have this pleasure or that pleasure rather than sacrificing it for the need of others. See, that's not giving preference, but that's the model of the church in Acts. They constantly sacrificed what they would in, have enjoyed for the benefit of those that didn't have the things that they had. And so this is why we collect offerings. This is why your commitment financially and with time and with resources is so important. Because not only does it bestow a blessing on your church, it will return a blessing to you as well. That's a promise. The third one, honor is practical. Not just lip service, but actually doing it. Practicing honor. In that same letter to Timothy, Paul writes in the same chapter, a little earlier, verse 3, honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety to, at the home or at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. So someone may appear to have need, but we need to do a little bit of an assessment. What does the family unit look like? What's happening in that dynamic? Because if they are in the family of God, they have a responsibility to serve, to honor parents, those that are aged and need that support. Just talking about it doesn't handle it. We need to be practical. We need to do it. Which leads us to the last one. Honor is personal. Personal. You see, things are not honored. People are. Things are not honored. People are. Personally, we show honor by acts of kindness, affection, care, and respect for others. That the Lord diagnosed this problem in Israel through the prophet Isaiah saying, these people draw near me with their mouths and honor me with their lips. See, they're honoring with their lips, but it says, their hearts are what? Far from me. You see, even with this, the commandments and this fifth commandment, this is a heart work for God. This isn't some frivolous uh, demand that's arbitrary. Parents, come on. Teach your kids the way they should raise up. And kids, honor your parents. No. God knows what this kind of relationship between parents and kids does to the family. They can grow up to be a model of what the family of God is. Amen? I'm concluding. I'm concluding with the promise embedded in this commandment. Uh, the apostle, again, Paul, reflecting on the fifth commandment in Ephesians 6, verse 1, says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with what? Promise. That it may be well with you, and you may live long life on earth. On the earth. All the commandments of God are meant to convey a better quality of life. Do you know that? If you want an abundant life, model it according to the commandments. That's God's intention. God promised that if we honor our father and mother, it will result in abundant life today for us as well, sustained by deep and meaningful relationships with our earthly parents long into adulthood. This promise is beneficial to the relationship also with our life-giving creator. 
When we honor our parents, we can't help but honor God as well. And in a spiritual sense, the promise refers to the future promised land, not just long life here on earth. You see, I I don't think we have much longer. Of course, I know that life has been going on longer than we expected, and there's kind of some indications in Scripture that it will take longer than we want it to. But there are things going on today that just help us understand that life is is growing short. We can't live as a society that we're becoming like much longer without killing each other. We're already doing it with words. What will it take to do to translate those words of hate into action? It behooves us as followers of God to practice a different kind of dynamic in our relationships, one based on love and grace and mercy and the goodness of God. Amen? If we are faithful to honor God in all that we do, we will live forever on the earth made new. And that's a promise I think all of us want to experience, don't we? This close communion between us and the parents who brought us into this world portrays a beautiful picture of the relationship between us and the God who created us, doesn't it? Even after we fell into sin, we, weren't, we didn't deserve to be saved, but God made a way. And then he sent that way to die in our behalf. And all of you are here in some way because you want the blood of Jesus Christ and the cross of Christ to stand in your place his life of perfection, his righteousness given to you so that your record, which is imperfect like mine, is not seen on judgment day, but it's the beauty of Christ and his character. As we partake of the Lord's Supper this Sabbath, let us reflect on how we can honor Christ, the one who created us and redeemed us from a life of sin under the dominion of the adversary because he alone is worthy of honor in reality, right? Ultimately, God is the one we honor. We have come to a time where we're going to partake in two ceremonies. The first is found in John 13 where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And in that washing of the disciples' feet, he said very clearly, you should do this to one another going forward. So we practice that as part of our communion service. In advance of communion, the emblems, we're going to dismiss to the rotunda. And those of you who would like to can partake of the foot washing service. As you get into the rotunda, there's going to be three different areas. So whether you're participating as a family or men are participating, or women, there'll be a section for you. So as we head over there, look for the area that you want to participate in that, in that foot washing uh, together. But I also want to say that if, if you don't, or if you're staying here, and those, when you finish coming back from the rotunda, um, I want you to be aware, we as a Seventh-day Adventist church practice open communion. You don't have to be a Seventh-day Adventist. You don't have to be a member of this church to partake of communion. We invite you to join us as we partake of the Lord's Supper today. If you believe in Jesus and he is your Savior, that's all that's necessary. So we encourage you, come back, or if you're staying here, uh, enjoy some time waiting for a little bit as those who want to wash feet I can exchange that, can participate, and then we'll see you here. When you come back, another instruction, when you come back, you can pick up the emblems from one of three tables. There's two, there's one on each side in the front, and there's one in the back, and then go ahead and take your seat at that time. All right? Father in heaven, we ask for your blessing as we dismiss for this 
ordinance of humility. Speak to our hearts and our lives today how we can, as we kneel before you in prayer with each other, how we can bring honor and glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is his name we pray. Amen. We'll see you back here in a few minutes.